In this edition of the Embedded Insiders, Brandon and Rich wonder how the COVID-19 pandemic has been affecting the tech sector, both from a financial perspective and with regards to the productivity of engineers now working at home. Are those engineers executing, innovating, or just relaxing? Later, Rich interviews John Labras, formerly a distinguished engineer and software architect at Silicon Labs. John shares some somewhat unpopular viewpoints on open source software in response to an embedded executives podcast with Gajot Singh of Link Software Technologies in late April. Who can guarantee that open source software will work every time, all the time? And what does that mean for open source and critical applications? Finally, the insiders circle back to highlight the best in show winners from Embedded World 2020. Good afternoon, and welcome to the slightly delayed version of the Embedded Insiders. I'm Rich Nast, Executive Vice President with Open Systems Media, and you are? Uh, Brandon Lewis, or I guess he's back. I've been out for Where a while. Where you been? Well, um, I, everybody knows, uh, well, I hope everybody knows that given the coronavirus, Things have been shut down and kind of slow, and I'm coming up on 10 years with open systems. I had some time saved up. So I figured, you know, the end of this year is probably going to be pretty crazy with everything getting shifted back into the fall. So I won't be able to take the time then. I might as well take it now. And although there wasn't a ton to do outside of the house, there's always a ton to do around and inside the house. Start painting uh, my office, you know, fixing up some things that the pets have destroyed. So... That's what I've been doing for the last couple of weeks, but it's good to be back. What have you been I doing? Have it from, I have it from a pretty good source that you just told a big lie. <laughs> I was told that you tried out for the Phoenix Suns and did not make it, and that's why you're back to Open Systems Media. I'm on the practice squad, and they only practice on Saturday. <laughs> <laughs> very right. good. Before well, we go, for whatever we go. the reason, it's, it's very nice to have you back. Thanks. We missed you. Before we go any further, I think I owe a mea culpa to everybody who listens to the Embedded Insiders. Because if you remember, Rich, right before Embedded World, I was like, oh, everybody, don't worry about this coronavirus thing. It's not a big deal. Everybody's going to be fine. Whoops. Maybe I should stick to embedded technology and stuff and <laughs> instead of <laughs> predicting. Well, you're perfectly qualified to be president of the United States. Right. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's probably a good segue into a discussion regarding what the heck is going out there in our community um, in this weird time. Um, I have been spending a lot of time with some of the CEOs of, in our industry and ask them how they're dealing with, with the virus. And what I gathered is that I'm, I'm getting like 90% of the truth. Um, and a lot of it is exactly what you'd expect. Everybody's working, not everybody. Many of the people are working from home. They're, when they have to go in the office, they're scheduling their time. Um, because in a lot of instances, there's certain equipment that has to be used. So they're making sure that um, only one person is there at a time and, and all that stuff. But I, I, I think it's hit some people a lot harder than, than they're letting on. And, and I get that, that you don't, want to, you don't want to be public with the fact that your business is hurting. But, it, um, but I think a lot of business is actually hurting. But it's such a weird time. You look at the stock market, and tech is doing fine. But I, I, I think in reality it's not. Any, anything that you're seeing? Well, I mean, my I've got some weird macroeconomic, you know, theories and frames of mind where, you know, the stock market is not, uh, you know, it's not indicative of what's happening right now, obviously. You know, for for a tech company to really feel the, the pain of this, uh, it, it's not going to happen, you know, for, you know, another few months, you know, six plus months, and then it's going to extend out for a long, long time. So a lot of, you know, the stock market is just based on projections and guesses and stuff. Um, but, you know, you do start to see people panicking, especially if you're a publicly traded company, that, uh-oh, our, cl our customers are, you know, the, the Boeings of the world or the GMs of the world or, you know, whatever your, the, hot, the hotels that you have as clients are all freezing things and uh, that uh, can make, your, uh, make you a little bit tense. Uh, but I imagine that, you know, things right now are probably going 
as normally as they can be given the fact that everybody's working from home and you know we do have a ton of capabilities you know these days that weren't available in the past like online collaborative collaboration tools and you know multi-tenant cloud platforms where people can still do their engineering um, a bigger question is are all of those engineers actually spending as much time getting you know project X done or are they fiddling around doing their you know DIY projects or like me you know trying to make their garage door opener smart or, or what have you yeah that's actually a really good point and uh, and I don't think that that's a negative thing if, if that is the case you know we've, we've been covering these um, development boards for a long time and and I and I think the employers actually really like when the employees are, are doing the Raspberry Pis and the Arduinos and every other dev kit that's out there because that often leads to an innovation that goes back to the company I wonder if there are going to be any uh, um, weird errors or vulnerabilities that pop up because everybody's dogs and kids were screwing around with them while they were writing that low-level C code. One of the things that I think is interesting about this time when you when when you're doing these Zoom calls with with people, you know, even you know at the highest level of companies, um, you hear you hear a baby crying in the background, or the, or the the person says, "Hang on, I got." I got somebody ringing the doorbell. I'll be right back. You know, and you, 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 you really learn that in a lot of cases, not in a lot of cases, in all cases, people are people. And, uh, and, and they have to deal with the things that uh, everybody has to deal with. Who would have thought people are people? We've been saying for a very long time here at OSM that engineers are people too. And it's something that we always try to take into consideration when we're doing stuff. Well, speaking okay. of dis distractions, Rich, uh, my wife just brought me a smoothie, so I guess that means it's breakfast time. I got to go. We're now joined by John Labrosse, architect of Micro COS Operating System, founder of Micrium, and former distinguished engineer and software architect at Silicon Labs. So what initiated this was um, we were chatting about a, uh, a podcast I did a few weeks ago with Gurjet Singh, the CEO of Link Software, and the topic there was open source. And um, you had some interesting comments with respect to that. Repeat back what you said to me earlier. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, I, I, I agree. I mean, there's, there's certainly some benefits with open source uh, with, with, with respect to Link Software is kind of a, he supports or they support uh, open source software, but it's all encompassed or all encapsulated in, inside of a framework where, if something goes wrong with the open source software, then the framework, the environment actually catches that and, and terminates the, the offending software. So uh, that, that's fine, except if it's, if it's medical equipment and you're, you're, you're killing the application that actually is uh, performing the, the, the bad code, then I'm not sure that that's necessarily a good thing either. So as much as you could support open source with an, a framework, framework like that. It's still a problem when it comes to running certain types of applications because if it crashes, you could still have some nasty thing. Now, if, if as it crashes, the software actually takes care of putting IO devices, specifically actuators in safe positions or even stopping actuators from continuing to operate, then maybe that's a safe thing to do. So I'm not exactly sure how Lynx handles all that. Now, is, is there the expectation with open source that um, even though you didn't pay for it, it's supposed to work right every time, all the time? Well, there's no guarantee, right? Who, who guarantees that? I mean, it's, it's, it's on the website. You don't know what the source is uh, sometimes. Uh, you don't know who's going to support it. There's no indemnification. Uh, if something goes wrong, who do you call? So you're, you're really on your own type of thing. So you, you, you get what you pay for, basically. Okay. Um, now, I know you know a lot more about this, being with what happened at Silicon Labs near the end of your tenure. Um, describe to the audience what happened with, with that code. So, so basically, the Micrium software was maintained by Silicon Lab uh, for the past three years. Uh, as, as is, we were selling, keep on selling licenses, irrespective of the platform, irrespective of the CPU. So it didn't matter whether it was a 
uh, uh, ARM Cortex from NXP, ST, uh, anybody's uh, ARM Cortex or, or Renesas RX or any, any platform, uh, Silicon Lab was still able to support and, and sell that through the Micrium office here in, in the Western Florida. And uh, that continued for a number of years and eventually uh, they decided to take a snapshot of the Micrium software and, and use that for their own use. So uh, for all their protocol stacks, the, uh, the wireless protocols they're using the Micrium uh, RTOS internally. And in fact, they made some modifications to the coding style and to, to maintain the same coding style they have throughout the, in the, 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 uh, the company. So there's really three versions of the Micrium software now. So there's the, the Silicon Lab version they modify for their own use. There's the, the Micrium software that they recently placed as open source on the Silicon Lab website. And finally, there's another version that a company called Weston Embedded here in, in Florida, which are all ex-Micrim employees, they started a company to support current customers that are using, current or future customers that are using the original Micrim software. So they created a version called Cesium, and Cesium is exactly the same thing as the Micro COS and the Micro CTCP, except now it's being supported and only modified uh, only modified when it's absolutely necessary. They're not going to modify the code. It's not anybody could actually modify the code. It's just, you know, those engineers that will do that. And case in point, in the case of the RTOS itself, uh, they will contact me and then they will ask me if, if I'm okay to make certain changes to the RTOS. But throughout this whole thing, uh, they're maintaining the, the code base. They're main, maintaining the coding style that, that we've been very much uh, uh, famous for as well as documentation. So documentation will also be maintained by, uh, by the, these guys. What about as new devices become available, will, will support be added for that? Absolutely. So as new devices are introduced, if cus customers would like to have ports on these new devices, of course, they will support those new devices as, as necessary. Now you mentioned the documentation. We all know documentation is not important, right? Of course not. Yeah, now the big trend nowadays is all oh, an API is all you need. And I believe me, I, I just don't believe in that whole concept. You don't get to see the whole picture when you're just seeing uh, an API set. I, I like to have, as you probably know from my books, I, I like to have a lot of illustrations explaining concepts. And with the APIs, you don't get the whole picture. And that's what I think uh, documentation and illustrations are really good at, at doing. Uh, and very often, a, a lot of open source is not explained. Here's the source code. You're on your own. You got to figure it out. There's limited documentation. A lot of it is in the open source itself. I personally like to have a separate document that describes how everything works so people could take that over and, and understand the limitations and all that. Why are you in the minority there? Uh, good question. I don't know. I don't know. Why do you think I'm in the mi minority? Well, I hate to say people are lazy, but, uh, you know, we, we used to use the excuse that it was, it was good job security to not document any of your code. Um, but is yeah. that a policy? Well, I mean, I, I think it's a shame that that's, if that's the case, I, I think it's a shame that that's the mentality still. I don't think that's what it is. I think everybody's pressed to hurry up and get their products out the door as quickly as possible. And, um, you know, you have to cut corners at some point. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's a big problem with the open sources. Unfortunately, there's nobody to identify you on the, on the code. There's nobody to support you necessarily. You got to go to third parties. Uh, all the different sources of open source, uh, the coding style is all different. So you got to put all that together. You could get name clash uh, for, uh, for, for namespace. Uh, I mean, there's, there's tons of issues. So I, I, to me, I'm, I'm very surprised. I've never really been a big proponent of open source for all these, all these reasons. Next, the insiders recap the Best in Show award winners from Embedded World 2020. I was just named one of the top uh, 100 most influential people in industrial IoT. I saw that. Are you aware of that? I was aware, and I was wondering Did when... Did you see where I was on the list? Yeah, you were like 13, and I was wondering when you published that report. <laughs> uh, I, I was quite honored, actually. But, um, it, was through, uh, it was through Analytica, right? That is correct. 
That is correct. A v- extremely reputable and obviously very intelligent firm. Obviously, a uh, significant part of their uh, portion of their annual revenue comes from one R Nass. <sighs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> but okay. If you, for those who are interested, if you want to, if you want to check it out, uh, it's on Alitica, on like on top of something, Alitica, the end of uh, Analytica. So on Alitica dot com. Or check out my my LinkedIn or my Twitter because I reposted it. Yes, and that and this is how you get to be a top a top one hundred IoT influencers by pointing people to your own social media platforms. Well, that's certainly one way, but it's it's my in, insightful comments on the industry. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Well, uh, like we said before, I was gone for a little while. Um, it actually started in a, about March, um, and here we are in May. But because the entire world uh, found itself in a tailspin uh, starting in March, we neglected to do one thing. What was that, Rich? The Best in Show Awards. Well, we announced the winners, but we didn't announce them via our podcast. But there's, there's a little asterisk there because, because we like to do them before the next live trade show. And since the next live trade show is actually in October, we're good. Oh, okay. Well, never mind. Uh, we, we're right on time then. So this is best <laughs> exactly in, this is best in show from Embedded World 2020. Um, we were there. It was uh, obviously a down year in terms of attendance and uh, also exhibitors. It was a little weird walking around the show floor and seeing uh, these booths that were built, um, but nobody exhibiting in them um, because people were pulling out at the last minute due to the coronavirus. Nevertheless, um, we still had a a significant number of uh, vendors show up and a significant number of best in show award winners. And we'll start with the AI and machine learning category. Do you want to kick that one off, Rich? Sure. Uh, the one that jumped out for me was from Lattice Semiconductor, their N- MVision Solutions stack. Um, I thought this was pretty impressive. And we actually got a, a lot of um, entries in this category. So, um, I would definitely say kudos to these guys for putting together something pretty significant. Yeah, and uh, another little note on that: uh, they keep uh, they keep advancing that Envision solution stack, and it's really effective if you're uh, somebody who's working on AI edge applications, so really low power uh, sort of inferencing type of systems. Um, a, the Envision stack is a really good platform to build on if you are also familiar with FPGA technology. Uh, yep. the next, and who are the other winners in, in, in that same category? Uh, also, uh, we had Atina Corporation and then uh, Adlink Technology, uh, who had the Busy AI board. You might want to check them, both of those companies out on their websites. Okay. Uh, next category is Analog and Power. And mm-hmm. we, so, we selected uh, from Maxim Integrated Products, the Max 40026 High Speed Comparator. Um, <laughs> Basically, it, it was the um, the specs that made a, a difference here, and it's pretty easy to compare products like this. You pick the one with the best specs, and this one did. Then you move into our bread and butter, and you, and you get into computer boards, systems, components, and, and peripherals, and this one uh, had far and away the most entries. We won't, we don't have time to go through all the details of each of them, but there was the Technologic Systems TS7100 that I was quite impressed with, it's like a self-contained box that has everything that you need to to design your system. Yep, and this uh, technologic systems little SBC slash box, as you pointed out, is based on um, an NXP item X6. Uh, so if you are familiar with the NXP brand of processors, there's a lot of performance in here for doing things like driving HMIs. Um, obviously, this is an industrial-oriented type solution, uh, but you can check that out on embeddedarm.com. That's the TS7100. Um, other winners in the category included Tanbus, uh, Tanbus Touch, um, Crystal Group, uh, Rugged Embedded Computer, the RE1218M, um, a user-configurable Xilinx Zinc Ultrascale Plus-based I.O. module from Acromag, which was one of my favorites, an ITX PC444 from Win Systems, 
nice little SBC I.O. board there. And then the Grizzly embedded server from Versalogic, Micromax's MMAX HR1UDT uh, system. And then an honorable mention in this category is the Thunder CX GX. 38B5550 from Tie-In Computer Corporation rounds out uh, the list. Nice to see that some of these guys are actually coming up with names that are not just XB6642, you know? Uh, yes, let's, let's uh, try and continue that. Human language uh, names for, for <laughs> <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Development tools and operating systems is the storyboard from Crank Software. Yeah, so Crank, um, Crank Software, actually, I had a chance to meet with them at the show. They were there. Um, they've got a really nice uh, UI development platform. So uh, think of Qt. It's just uh, more really focused on some of these highly embedded applications. You should really check them out. Able to develop nice, interactive, immersive UIs really quickly with the storyboard product from Crank Software. Okay, then we go to memory and storage. You can't design a board or a system without memory and storage. InnoDisk had an SSD, which was pretty innovative in my influential opinion. <laughs> yes, InnoDisk was one of the members or one of the winners in the uh, memory and storage category, along with Kioxa Europe for their XFM Express. One that stood out to me was uh, the Sempernor flash memory from Cypress Semiconductor. Cypress, obviously, a big player in that market. This Nor flash is really um, intended for use <clears throat> in uh, more critical types of applications like automotive and industrial. So if you are looking for something that meets safety certification requirements, you know, in automotive, maybe ASIL D, this would be a good place to start the Sempernor flash memory from Cypress. Now we move on to security, which is a topic that we talk about a lot here. One of the winners was Ultrasock with their Ultrasock Bus Sentinel. Yeah, the Ultrasock Bus Sentinel is a really cool little product. If you are familiar at all with the Risk V community, you're probably familiar with uh, Ultrasock. But basically, Bus Sentinel is a little piece of IP that sits down and monitors uh, what's coming across an interface like the CAN bus so that you can help protect your system from malevolent pieces of uh, traffic or you know, bad code or whatever um, in an application like maybe, again, automotive or industrial systems uh, that are particularly sensitive. So if you're interested in finding out more, check out ultrasock.com. And those Maxim folks were quite busy. They had a second winner in the security, in the security category. They're Max 32520 Chip DNA Secure Arm Cortex M4 microcontroller um, was pretty cool stuff. Very good. And we're headed down the home stretch. Final category here uh, for 2020 Best in Show and Embedded World is Wired and Wireless Connectivity, which we also group in IoT and Rich's favorite topic, which is Industrial IoT. <laughs> So I'm quite influential in this category. Did you know that? <laughs> I I uh, I heard. You told, <laughs> actually, the person I first heard it from was you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so um, a couple of the winners in this category were a Dialog Semiconductor with their Smart Bond Tiny DA14531, Silicon Labs Scilab with the EFR32 BG22 Bluetooth SOCs. Nordic Semiconductor with their NRF52833 Bluetooth 5.1 SOC, which supports Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth Mesh, Thread, Thread, and Zigbee. So if you're looking to hedge your bets on those short-range connectivity protocols, that's a good one to take a look at. And then finally, a uh, runner-up in this category was InnoDisk again with their EMPL G203 product. Here's a pretty controversial topic for you, one that we probably shouldn't address. Nordic Semiconductor, why haven't they been acquired? That's actually a really good question, and I've, I've thought about this in the past. And it may be just because they have such a big market share that I would, I would imagine that the asking price is probably pretty high. Uh, what do you think? Uh, I would agree with you. However, as we've seen, you know, that doesn't tend to stand in the way. We've seen some huge dollars thrown out at some of these companies where you 
you say to yourself, why did they spend so much? Um, I, I, I don't really know what the reason is for that. Uh, I'm surprised that they have not been gobbled up by somebody. Uh, especially with, you know, especially in such in, in a market space like Bluetooth, which, you know, you can imagine just a massive company, you know, pick any of the, of the big bleeding edge tech giants saying, you know what, forget all of this screwing around with our trying to develop our own smart home products. Why don't we just basically buy the Bluetooth market um, and dominate that way? Um, so, yeah, that is pretty interesting. It, it, it might be cool to have somebody on from North, Nordic. I don't know if they're going to tell us why they why they haven't been acquired yet or what the asking price is. But, you know, have them on and, and give us their thoughts on the Bluetooth uh, sector and how that's trending. What do you say? I will work on that. And maybe for next week we can have them on as a guest. We'll, we'll see if I'm influential enough to get somebody to come on. Does Bluetooth count as industrial IoT or is that just IoT? Uh, I've seen some applications where you, where you get down to that latest spec with the super low energy. Um, whatever. Yeah, we'll get them on. Okay, cool. This is, this is interesting stuff. Certainly congratulations to everybody who won. Thanks for listening to this edition of Embedded Insiders. For daily industry news, videos, and podcasts, visit our website, embeddedcomputing.com.